Father, we love you so much, and we're just so grateful for the opportunity to gather together in your house to minister to your heart. We love you. What a joy it is. What an honor and a privilege it is to worship you, the King of Kings. Thank you, Lord, for drawing us to Jesus. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for seeing us. Thank you, Lord, for not leaving well enough alone, for not leaving us in our mess, God. You're faithful, and I'm just so grateful for you, for every moment with you, Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence, and thank you for whatever you want to do in each and every one of us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so... I have no funny jokes. I'll leave that for Pastor Bob. He just has the best ones. There's no competition, so <laughs> I'm just not even going to try. <laughs> tomorrow. Come back tomorrow at 10 for the best jokes. Um, so God's been kind of speaking to me about this for a while, and I guess we're going to talk about it tonight. So here goes nothing. I want to talk to you about convenience. And, and the God of convenience. America is very well known for being, having a culture of convenience, right? Everything is super convenient. We don't even have to leave our house anymore to go grocery shopping, okay? Like, say goodbye to lines, standing in lines, say goodbye to having to go to the bank to get money out. You don't have to, you literally don't even have to leave your house anymore. You could work remote. You could, you can pay your bills online. You can, you could go through the drive through or even better, you can order DoorDash. You don't even have to do that. You don't even have to cook. Like, the whole world can take care of you from your couch. That's convenient, right? I mean, and from the flip side, you could do really bad things too. It used to be that you had to sneak around in the dark shadows to get pornography, or maybe you have to sneak out so your wife doesn't know you're gambling at the casino. You don't even have to do that anymore. You can just get it from your phone. You can just do it right at home, which is not good. Don't do that. Actually, when I was preparing... Just to see if it's possible, I Googled to see if it's possible to order children, and it is. I could adopt a child. I actually looked through a catalog of children today. I, could ad I was like, Mike, there's the sibling group. There's four of them. They're so cute. And he's like, Sarah, stop looking. <laughs> stop looking. They, had, you had to, they only were going to go to Tennessee families. It was the rule, so... But anyways, you can even adopt children online now. I mean, we knew you could get dogs and cats. You could go to Pet Finder and do that. Now it's children. Oh, you need a spouse? You can get those online too. You can order those also. So we have a culture of we want what we want and we want it now. We're not happy with an oven. We want the microwave. And now we're not even happy with the microwave. We want the drive through And now we're not even happy with that. We want DoorDash, which honestly, the drive through is way faster than DoorDash. I mean, just in my neighborhood anyway. We have slogans like, have it your way. Or I grew up with, the customer's always right. And it just feels like it's really breeded a culture of entitlement, a culture of isolation, it's causing us to not have to be bothered by anyone else or anyone else's needs. We can truly just focus on ourselves and what we want. Self-help, self-love, self, 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 right? I don't, even, I don't even have to think outside of myself anymore. And there's a lot of us that don't know how to think outside of ourselves. We don't know how to serve. We don't know how to help. We don't know how to love because we're so focused on ourself. Mike and I were at, sorry, Pastor Mike and I, <laughs> we were at, we were in the cities, um, in our stomping grounds. This is where we grew up. And there was a mall there. 
And we took the kids and we were like, man, we used to hang out here at this mall. Like this was where we hung out. It was super cool. And we like, you know, just walked around. We didn't have money. So we were just like, this is what we did. And there was a new store in the mall that I'd never seen before. And it was called the Museum of Self. And I was like, wow, <laughs> we've come that far. That's where we are. Museum of Self. It truly is the world, the culture has truly turned our eyes off of others, off of God, and onto ourselves. Look at yourself. What do you need? What do you want? What do I want? What do I need? What makes me happy? What's going to fulfill me? What are my dreams? What are my hopes? What, are, what do I want? What makes me feel good? What, make me, what makes me uncomfortable? What offends me? And unfortunately, like I said, that's isolation. It breeds loneliness. We don't have relationship. We don't even know how to have relationship. And we don't know how to cook, people. We don't know how to cook. I'm learning to cook. My mom cooked everything. Like, we never got to go out to eat. So I think that's why I was like, I'm always going to go out to eat when I grow up. Lord is helping me. He's helping me. I'm learning. Also, my husband can cook. Thank you, Jesus. But... We want what we want, but we don't want to do what we have to do to get it. We just want the end result right now. We want to push a button and have, oh my gosh, in Atlanta, there's a car vending machine. I am not kidding. We were driving, we, we, dro we drove through Atlanta, and there's a car vending machine. You can go on this app, push a couple buttons, and there's, and here comes a car, and it drives to you. It'll come to your house. Like, we don't even have to do anything to get what we want, and that's what we want, is to, is to not have to put in any work, not have to try, not have to expel any effort or energy or blood, sweat, or tears. We want it easy, we want it my way, and I want it now. I wish I could say that that was not me because that was totally me. I was so selfish, guys. That was totally me. Thank you, Jesus, that he is, he's still fixing me. And I wish that, that this wasn't in the church, but unfortunately, Western Christianity isn't much different. We try to create shortcuts. We scheme. We manipulate people. We manipulate situations to get where we want to get what we want. I, I googled the definition of convenient because when you Google words, you realize that you don't really know English. <laughs> convenient means fitting in well with a person's needs, activities, and plans. So whatever I want or need, it needs to fit in well with my needs, with my plans, and with my activities. So I give my life to Jesus, and I come to church, and I go to small group, but it all has to be real convenient for me. It has to fit into my schedule, into what I want, into, into my plans. If, it, if, it's, if it's inconvenient, I just won't go. I just won't do it. Waking up at 4 a.m. to spend time with Jesus sounds real inconvenient when I want to sleep in, right? I'm talking to myself, guys, so please don't be mad at me. When Mike and I moved to the area from Georgia years and years and years ago, we were church dating. And we were in pretty different places. We were both very, very baby. We were babies in Christianity, um, I was looking, I, I'm not trying to say that I was better than him because I certainly wasn't, but we, were, we would go to different churches and we were church dating, like find the one that we want. We want one with a good kids program. We want the worship to be nice and hit me right here. I want the word to be good and not too long. And I want, I want to like the pastor who's preaching and I want people to welcome me and I don't want to, which are all good things, right? We want, the, we need to welcome people, right? People need to feel like they belong. This is good things. Walking into these churches that we dated, we went all over, all the churches in Eau Claire and Chippewa, and not everyone, but we went to many. And I was looking for the, the feeling of the tangible presence of God. And I was so disappointed over and over. And Mike was looking for 
the music that he likes, which I was too. I was too. But, but what we were doing was we weren't looking necessarily for Jesus. We were looking for us. We were, we were looking for what suits us, what makes us feel good, what, what, will, what will be good for us. And I'm not saying those things are bad. We need to have a good kids program. We need to welcome people into our body. Like we need to have worship. But to be fair, guys, worship isn't for you. Worship is for Jesus. So, so when we sing songs that are, that are glory to you, all the glory, we magnify your name, that's because that's who we're actually singing to. That's, that's what worship is. And I'm so grateful for our body and I'm grateful for all of you because we get it. Thank you, Jesus, that we get it. Now, talking about this, I was like, man, we live in Chippewa Falls, and we've got people here that live down there too. Shout out to our Chippewa Valley peeps. Woo woo. We've got the Walzacks here who live in Mondovi. How far of a drive is it? An hour and a half they drive to get to church here every weekend. Mike and I drive 45 minutes, Pastor Mike and I drive 45 minutes every Saturday, every Sunday for the most part. And our kids come Wednesday and he comes Wednesday. Like we drive up here essentially four times a week. And if I need another sozo because I get them all the time, shout out to Amy, then that's a fifth time in the week that we'll drive up here. And I was talking with Mike and he was like, we could go to any church. There's so many churches. Sorry, Pastor Mike. There's so many churches. We could walk down our street and walk past five churches. There are churches on every corner. Thank you, Jesus, there are churches on every corner, right? But we're not just looking to go to church. We're not just looking to check the box. We're not just looking to make our make that, you know, Christian part of us feel good, like we've accomplished our hour for the week and now we can go and live our life as convenient and as self-centered as we possibly can. That's not what we're looking for. We are looking for Jesus. When we came here, however many years ago it was, I don't know, there's discrepancies on that. I think it was 2018, but I don't know. When we came here, we encountered God we encountered the real, living, tangible presence of God. And we were like, we're not going. And we weren't in a bad church. We were in a good church. Like I felt God, but I was, I literally was slain in the spirit the first time I was here. And I didn't even believe in that. Like I was bowled over, knocked out by the presence of the Lord. And I was like, man, I want that. So 45 minutes sounds pretty great. We'll drive it. We'll drive it every, as often as we can to be with you guys in the presence of the Lord because we're not just going to church to check a box. We're going to church to minister to the Lord, to encounter God, but also we have fallen in love with all of you. We have become, we have become in covenant with you. We said, you know what? We're not just looking for people to say hi to on the weekend. We want relationship. We want what's real. We want what's lasting. We want to encourage you and we want you to encourage us. We want to mourn with you and we want you to mourn with us. We want what's real. We're not looking for acquaintances. We're not looking for, you know, fair weather friends. We want what's real. And we found it here in you guys. So thank you for loving us, even with all of our flaws and as jacked up. I'm sure we've offended you and if we haven't, we will. So just so you know, but that's what we're looking for. What's real. We want covenant. We want what the Bible talks about as church. We want acts church. We want sell all your things and let's take care of each other church. That's what we want. God is not a God of convenience. In fact, he's probably like anything but convenient. I heard somebody say, uh, somebody was speaking at Bethel. This was years ago. I was listening online. Um, And Bethel's in Redding, California. I don't know if you've ever been to Redding or even looked for Redding on a map. It is not easy to get there. You do not get to, you could fly right into Redding for $1 million, but instead, (laughs) 
sensible people will we'll fly to Sacramento and then you drive two and a half hours to Reading and you often have to take a connection there. So this person who was speaking commented on that and he said, man, you gotta be hungry to come here to Bethel. And that's what God's looking for is your hunger. And I, when I heard that, I thought, man, you gotta be hungry to come here to World Harvest. You gotta be hungry to drive an hour and a half. How many churches are between your house and here? One million, probably, <laughs> at least. It, but it's worth it. Not just because, I'm not saying God's not in those other churches, because he is, but you have relationship here, right? You, you find something different when you choose to, to not just check the box, but actually invest, open yourself up, it, go to, get in a small group. If you don't feel like you have that intimacy with us, get in a small group because you will. You will. You will find community. You will find brothers. You will find sisters. You will find people who will stand alongside you in the worst moments of your life and in the best. I promise you that. Christianity, real Christianity, is very uncomfortable. It's actually very inconvenient. It's laborious, which I googled that word too, <clears throat> which basically means really uncomfortable. It takes effort. It takes time, energy, blood, sweat, and tears. The disciples were called to leave everything they knew and follow Jesus, not to fit him into their lives, not to fit him into their schedule so neat and tidy for, on Sunday morning for 45 minutes and then live the rest of his. I heard somebody say, he said, Jesus didn't come and die for 45 minutes and 20 bucks so that you could live the rest of your six days and 23 hours without him. He did not die for that. He died for everything. He died for all of you. Jesus turned the disciples' reality upside down. They left everything to follow him. And he will turn your reality upside down. Now we're talking about convenience. So there's a story in the Bible that is one of my favorites. I've been studying it for quite a while. And you probably have heard it. So the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament is where the Lord dwelt between the cherubim, right? They believe, like the presence of God is in the Ark of the Covenant. This is the presence of God. So in 1 Samuel chapters 4 through 7, it talks about how the Philistines got, they basically stole the Ark of the Covenant. They got the Ark. And there's a whole lot of stuff that happens there, like this is not working, we're all getting tumors, I hate this, our, he, this, this God is killing our God, chopped his head off and his hands, like we don't want this ark, we don't want this God, we need to give this God back to Israel because we're not doing this. So they, they made a new cart, they put the ark on it, they put, it's a whole thing, it's really cool if you read the story, because it could only be God. And basically, God leads the ark back into Israel. And the ark winds up at this gentleman's house named Abinadab. And the ark stayed there for 20 years. Now, then we have all this stuff happens. Saul's anointed the first king of Israel, and then David's anointed, and all this stuff happens. And then 20 years later, in 2 Samuel 6, and you can also read it in 1 Chronicles 13, because they parallel each other. That's also really cool if you read the Bible like that, because I'm like flipping, and I'm like, man, this has a little more detail. Oh, man, what does this say? Oh, is it the same? It's really cool. You should do it. Anyways, so David decides, David's now king, and he's like, man, we got to get the ark back. We need the presence of God. The presence of God has been neglected. We've been doing life as God's people all this time without his presence. So he took 30 choice men. He went and built a new cart. He went and got the ark. He put the ark on the new cart. And he's got the oxen and they're going and they're traveling and the oxen stumble and there's this man, Uzzah, who was Abinadab's son. Remember, Abinadab had it for 20 years. Uzzah reaches his hand out to steady the ark and God strikes him dead. Boom. I know. I was offended too and so was David. David was angry at God and he was afraid because <laughs> that would be really scary, right? But 
David didn't, he, but he knew the character of God. So even though he was offended, even though he was angry, he, he trusted in the character of God. He was like, all right, let's put, here's Obed-Edom's house. He's a Gittite. He is not an Israelite. He's not one of God's people. He's actually, I, go, I looked up what Gittite is, which I'm probably saying it wrong. You could probably help me out there, Jeff. But it's basically a Philistine. It's a Gentile. It's not, he was not an Israelite. He was not one of God's people. They're, but his house must have been right there. So they're like, let's just put this in here. We're gonna, we'll, we'll go back to that at some point. They go to Jerusalem, which is roughly seven to nine miles away. And for three months, the ark lived in Obed-Edom's house and Obed-Edom's family was super blessed. So David was like, uh, no. So for those three months, he's reading the scriptures. He wants to know, what did God tell Moses? Okay, and if you read in First Chronicles, you'll see that David was like, okay, God said that the ark has to be carried on the backs of the Levites. It has to be, so we did it wrong. We didn't consult the Lord. We just got a little rash. We got a little excited, and we went. We took some steps before asking God. So now he gathers. He gathered, well, First. First Chronicle says he gathered all of Israel and he gathered all of the Levites. Well, he gathered the, yeah, I don't think it was all the Levites, but I counted. Um, and it was approximately 868 Levites that he gathered. And they were assigned to, some of them were to play instruments. Some of them were to sing um, songs of resounding joy. And then some of them were to carry the ark on poles on their backs, right? Like this. Pole. Like pallbearers, but we'll say ark bearers, okay? So David gathers these guys, the Levites, they go out and they get the ark. And, and here's what happens. Get this. Sam's going to love it. You probably know it. The ark's on the Levites' backs, right? And, and here's David up front, and he's like dancing because there's music, and he's just like, yes, worshiping the Lord. Every six paces, 1 Samuel 6 says, and so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all of his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. Six paces, this is seven to nine miles, guys, okay? This is approximately 30,000 feet. Six paces, so one, two, three, four, five, six. I don't know if David was taller or shorter than me, so I'm guessing roughly about the same because he was Jewish, so he was probably not like eight feet tall. <laughs> Sorry if that was stereotypical. I wasn't trying to be that, so forgive me. See, I told you I'd offend you. I just, I warned you. So six paces, he's like, give me an oxen slaughter. Give me a fatted sheep slaughter. We're going to dance before the Lord with all of our might. All the while, the musicians are going and the singers are singing, right? And then they're like, all right, six paces. Three, four, five, six. F slaughter, slaughter. Dance before the Lord with all my might. Have you ever danced before the Lord with all of your might? I encourage you to give it a shot. Probably do it alone in your house at first because you're probably uncomfortable to do. But if you're bold and courageous, please do it here. Like, please. But David did this for 30,000 paces, for seven to nine miles. This, and on foot, all the slaughtering, all of that, it probably took quite a long time, right? So... David wanted convenience. He built a new cart. It would have been really nice to put that ark on the new cart and have the oxen pull it. The Levites wouldn't have to carry it. Nobody would have to break a sweat. We could just walk seven to nine miles. We'd get there in like an hour. That's no problem. That's nothing. That's nothing, huh? Seven to nine miles an hour. Well, it's an ox cart, so I assume two, okay, we're going to go two hours, guys. <laughs> two hours. I don't, I don't run or any of that stuff, so I don't, I'm just really winging it up here, guys. So we'll say two hours. That seems really convenient. That fits the schedule. If you read, you'll find that David had some 
battles that he had in, in, during that three months. So he had some stuff to do. He had some stuff on his schedule. His agenda was full. And he was like, man, I've got a couple hours. Let's go get the ark. We'll put it on the cart. It'll be great. And then Uzzah dies and he's like, oh crap. God is not a God of convenience. God does not care about your schedule. He doesn't care about what's, what's gonna work best and what's gonna fit best into your plan. God is not altogether like you. We cannot make God in our image anymore. He, we were made in his image. We need to get to know him. I want to note in 2 Samuel 6.16, thanks Colton, we're on fire tonight. Michelle, Michal, we looked it up, Michal is King David's wife. Saul's daughter, okay? She saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. I just want to point out that when you decide to give Jesus everything, and you decide to love him unashamed, unabandoned, there's going to be people that don't like it. There's going to be people in your family that are very uncomfortable with it. They're going to be frustrated that you have to leave the birthday party early because you have to get to church. They're going to be frustrated that all you want to talk about is Jesus. They're going to be cranky that you can't make this or that event because you're leading a small group. People are going to get really cranky because it's inconvenient for them that you have made God the center of your life. But... He's worth it. Each process that you're going through matters. God is preparing you. He's maturing you. He's honing you. He's refining you. So we want to skip the process and just get right to the good stuff. But we skip the honing. We'd skip the refining. We'd skip the stuff that matters. If you just ate the outside of an Oreo, you'd skip the good stuff, guys. Like, eat the inside of the Oreo. Get a double stuff. Triple stuff is a little much. But the double stuff is good. We need to learn to trust the process as inconvenient as it may seem. Exodus 13, verses 17 and 18. I think Colty has that. I'm going to read it here. This is before... This is before David. This is Moses. He's let my people go. He's pulling the Israelites. They're coming out of Egypt, right? Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines. Although that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. God could have led the people by the way of the world, by the way of culture, by the way of society, even though it was quick, it was easy, it was near, it was less painful, it was like, it was like the, the wide paved road. But Jesus, doesn't he say there's a narrow road and that's the one that we need to choose? The one that goes by the way of the wilderness? The one that is going to actually prepare us for the promised land? Because if we get to the promised land by that quick, easy shortcut, by the way of the world, we get there, we won't know what to do with it. We will not be ready. We will not be mature. We will, we will, man, I'm telling you, I've known this man since I was in middle school. If him and I would have gotten married out of middle school, that would have been weird and uncomfortable and illegal. <laughs> but if we would have started dating back then and we would have gotten married out of high school, we, we would probably be divorced. We were not ready for each other. We were so broken. We were so messed up. We came from two totally broken, messed up Lives, and this was the Israelites. They had been living in bondage for 400 years. They did not know how to take land and to own it. They didn't know how to possess the land yet. They needed to learn. They needed to learn who God was. They needed to learn how to be children of God. And they needed to learn how to rule in a land that was their own. They didn't know yet. 
My kids should not move out when they're 13, 14 years old, even though I'm pretty sure almost every 13, 14 year old will say at one point, I want to be emancipated. My kids literally have said this and I'm like, girl, (laughs) yeah, okay. My, my kids aren't here, so I'm just going to say it. My children have, they want the money without having to go to work. They don't want to have to go to work. That's, it's time consuming, it's exhausting, it's boring, right? It's inconvenient. They want the gas money, but they don't want to go to work to earn it. They will scheme, they will, <laughs> they will do, like, mom, can I do your laundry? And then they're like, you do her laundry and I'll give you something. And I'll get, get, yeah, it's literally like this scheme that happens. Just to avoid having to work and do the process, right? But if we look through the Bible, Joseph had a promise when he was a kid, but he was not ready for that. He was not ready. He needed to be matured so that when he was right hand to the Pharaoh, he could save an entire people group. Simon Peter needed to be humbled and turned into a leader because he wasn't. John the Baptist needed to be kept out in the wilderness eating locusts and honey so that he could be prepared. I'm not saying that he was kept out there as a prisoner, okay? This was his choice and it's your choice too. He was out in the wilderness giving his whole life and his whole attention to the Lord so that he could be prepared to prepare the way of the Lord, Saul to Paul, I don't even have to explain that one. We all know that one. He needed a major shift in passion and focus. The hardest and most beneficial work happens in the dark. It happens when nobody's looking. It happens when you're not standing in front of a crowd. They have no idea. It's not when you're, when you're up here preaching or leading worship or, you know, it happens in the dark. We all know the story of the 10 virgins. If you don't, it's in Matthew 25. I encourage you to read it. There's 10 virgins. They've they've all got lamps. The bridegroom's coming. Five of them are wise and they have lots of oil. Five of them are foolish and do not have enough oil to last, right? So this oil is your time with Jesus. It is costly and it is inconvenient. And you are the only one who can buy it. I cannot buy it for you. I cannot borrow you mine. And you can't shortcut your way to getting oil. You can't. There's no scheming. There's no manipulation. There's no way. But you're the only one who can choose to go buy oil. And mind you, it's buying oil because it's costly. Because it costs you. Because it's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of waking up early and spending your time alone with him. It's a sacrifice of maybe you need to stay up late and spend time with him. Maybe you need to not watch your favorite TV show so that you can be in the word. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's, I don't know. You get what I'm saying. I don't have to keep going. Sam gets it. (laughs) Oil is not cheap and it's not convenient. There are no shortcuts and it's produced in crushing. Yeah, there's no other way to get it. It's crushing. When no one else is around, when nobody's dancing and worshiping beside you, when nobody's sitting next to you and taking notes during church service, that's not oil. You buy oil by going to him alone. I'm not saying that coming here, you don't get oil. You probably get some oil, okay? But it gets real dry come Wednesday, Your flame is getting real low. Your flame's about to go out, and by next Sunday, you don't even want to go. It's like dragging you, right? Because your oil's out. Because your oil's gone and your flame's gone, right? Your passion is gone. Your desire for him is gone. We need to pay the cost to have that oil so our passion will stay ignited. Oil in... Oil is your secret history with God. 
Like Jacob, it's wrestling with him until the break of day. There's gonna be times that you stay up all night praying, wrestling with God. I need this. I, I need my kid to come home, Lord. You promised this. You said this. This is what your word says. Your word says this. Maybe you have somebody with a diagnosis of death and you're like, uh-uh, Jesus, your word says that they will live and not die. Your word says that by your stripes they are healed. Your word says this. And maybe you spend the entire night wrestling with God. That's oil. That's oil to not give up when the rest of the world says it's hopeless. That's buying oil. Maybe it's your 4 a.m. 4 a.m. I said that. Study and prayer. It's you having that, that morning date with him every day. He's waiting. He'll show up because he's a God of covenant. And he won't break his word. So he'll show up. He'll be sitting there on that chair waiting for you. Will you show up? I literally, this was like literally the picture I had the other morning when I didn't want to wake up. And I had a vision of him sitting at my kitchen table and I was like, you're waiting for me. Of course I'm gonna get up. He'll give you the grace, guys. He'll give you the grace. I tell him, I'm like, Holy Spirit, you gotta help me because I'm tired. And he's like, I got you, come on. Oil is bought hiding in your car, crying out to God because your marriage is failing and you don't know what else to do. It's alone in your hospital room when you're praying because you were just told that you're having a miscarriage and you don't have anybody with you and you have to deal with that alone. It's when you're driving in your truck and you're suicidal and you decide, all right, Jesus, I'll give you a shot because I have no other hope. It's when tragedy strikes and you have no idea what to do and you turn to him. I'm just gonna be honest. I know we are not promised tomorrow. The word actually says that, so just so you know. We are not promised tomorrow. When tragedy strikes, I've heard people say, I don't know, and I've probably said it, I don't know how they could turn to God when they were praying for this and they were praying for healing and the person died. I don't know why that happens. I've seen people healed and I've seen people not healed. I cannot stand up here and tell you the explanation because I don't know. But what I do know is in that moment, why would you not want him? How could you, how could you process that without him? How could you get through that without him? He's the only way to get through that. When you have a loved one die, when a child dies, when your mom gets cancer and she isn't healed and she dies, when something like that happens, you need him. Trust me. He's the only way you're gonna get through it. He's the only way you're gonna heal. He's the only way that you will wind up with a promise on the other end of it. He's the only way. Crappy stuff happens to us, guys. It happens. It's, it sucks. We see things happen that we really didn't plan for or want but he's the only way we're gonna get through it. Oil is not good deeds. These 10 virgins were virgins, they were pure. They weren't out sinning, they were pure and spotless, right? They were just foolish, right? Good deeds is not oil. You can serve and serve and serve and serve and serve, which is good and you should, but if you're not having that secret time with him, then you don't have oil then what are you pouring out? You're, you're not even pouring out from his strength. You're doing it from your own. We need that. Those foolish virgins, they lacked relationship with Jesus. They lacked history with him. They weren't building that relationship, that history is built in that secret place. They lacked it. So, they, so the, of course, it didn't make sense to them. Why would you turn to Jesus when this tragedy happened? Why would you, you know, how could you pray? Like, aren't you mad? Yeah, I'm mad. So I'm going to go tell God I'm mad. Your word says this. So why did this happen? I'm going to go tell him. I'm going to go tell him that I'm mad, that I'm hurt, that I don't understand. And because I know his character, because of all the history I've built with him, I know he's going to comfort me. I know he's going to give me peace. And I know that I may not understand at the end of the day why that happened. But I do know that he'll be with me. The foolish virgins were living for right now, the moment. 
They made short-term decisions and they were not considering long-term consequences. This is a real word for me. We often make a decision not considering long-term. I, I have met, and I, I, I don't know, I probably was one. I've met a lot of people who, they chase after revival services. They chase after conferences. They wanna go to this event and that event and this big speaker and that big speaker. And these are all really good things and we need them. I love them. I love them, okay? I'll be there with you guys. But, they, but if there's no secret place, if there's no oil buying going on, then that's their source, then they're essentially dancing around someone else's fire. They're essentially going and living vicariously through what other people have as a culture. We have a culture here of living in his presence. We have a, we have a culture here of living with him, serving with him, working with him. Everything we do is with the presence of God. We chase after him and we seek him passionately because we know him and we love him. And our secret time, it just fuels us more. And so, yeah, we're fiery. Yeah, we're excited. Yeah, we have faith when others don't. Yeah, we have hope when people are hopeless. And yeah, when I am out of faith and hope, I can lean on you and you will get, you will pray for me and you will have hope for me and you will hold me up because that's, again, remember community, we need each other. But if, but if you don't have that secret time and you're just chasing revival services and you're just chasing conferences, man, that's gonna be a really cool flame and it's gonna burn out. It's gonna burn out and there will not be lasting fruit. I went to a conference with Pastor Shar and some other leaders. I don't even know, um, Open Heavens, when was that? That was a few, a couple years ago. God did something in me there. I have no idea what he did, but I know I was on the floor and Amy gets it. She had to, she had to carry me to my seat. I have no idea what happened. I had to go back and listen to the recording of the person who was speaking because like during the worship right before the person spoke, I was hit with something and I was on the floor sobbing, shaking, trembling, feeling like my whole body was on fire and I was maybe gonna explode, I wasn't sure. But God did something. He planted something in me in in that moment, and I had a choice to make. I could steward this seed. I had no idea what happened, so it's like, I don't know what this is, God, but I'm gonna seek you and try to figure it out, or I'm just gonna, you're, I'm gonna hope you tell me, because I really can't figure it out. So I'm just gonna seek you and let you continue whatever this work you started in me. I could do that, and I could let that grow, and I could water that seed, and I could get in the Word, and I could spend that time with Jesus in the secret place, and I can continue to steward that seed well and let it grow, let it take root, let it, let it blossom, let it create fruit in my life, or I could go and not be in the secret place, and I could compromise. And before Open Heavens, I did compromise a lot. It was like, uh, I'm tired this morning. I'm just not going to get up. But I asked my husband, I said, did you notice a difference? I asked him this morning because I was preparing for this, right? I was like, did you notice a difference? And he was like, oh, yeah, absolutely. You were different when you came back and you've never been the same, right? I've never been the same. Because I chose to steward the, what, whatever God did in me, I, cho I chose to steward it the best I could because I didn't want that flame to fizzle out. I believe what God is doing in our body right now, there's a new generation rising up and I'm not just talking about kids because I'm an old lady and it's happening in me and it's happening in Jeff Vesta. Not calling you old, but we're old. <laughs> it's happening in the church. We're rising up as a generation who isn't going to settle for fake we don't want what's fake anymore. We don't want to hear all of the stories of all these fabulous things that God did. We want to see it. We want to touch it. We want to experience it. I want the real tangible thing for myself. I want to smell it, taste it, feel it. I tell him every time I'm praying, I want to touch your face, Jesus. I have heard stories of you walking through the wall into people's bathrooms. Walk through my wall, Jesus. I might poop my pants and that's okay. <laughs> 
Walk, walk through my wall, Jesus. I want what's real. I want what's true. And I want my own stories. I want my own encounters with you. That is what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. He's causing that fire to burn up in us that we're not satisfied with living off of somebody else's miracles and stories. We don't want to live vicariously through what happened and what was. We want what is now. We want what is real and we want what is for us. And we're not going to get that if we try to fit him into our schedule. We have to get outside of ourselves and say, God, what are you doing? Pastor Bob says all the time, ask God, what are you blessing? I want to do it instead of asking God to bless what you're doing. So many people ask God, come bless what I'm doing. Come bless my idea. And they have no fruit and they wonder why. Because God's over here and his plan for your life, his plan that he put in you when he knit you together in your mother's womb, it might be way over here and you're trying to do this over here. I don't want to do this over here. I want to do whatever. God, what did you, what is your plan for me? What is your purpose for me? Why did you make my personality like this? Why did you make me to love people? Why did you make me to be the funniest person in every room? <laughs> You know, am I supposed to be a comedian? I don't know. But I want to do what God's purpose is for my life. I don't want to try to make it up and try to do something that I think because I like it. We have got to stop with this narcissistic gospel. And I know that's a hard word, but I Googled that word too. And it means to be incredibly self-focused, self-centered, thinking about self, worrying about self. It's all about me. That's the culture that we have. That's what we're breeding. And, and everybody in the world says, ah, narcissist, you're a narcissist. Everyone's a narcissist. But literally that's what is being bred in our culture. That is what is being created and bred. And we can't see it in the church anymore. And I don't think we want to see it in the church anymore because we're changing directions. God has been sifting everything that will be sifted. He's shaking everything that will be shaken. And everybody who isn't on board with what he's doing is, is not going to go with them. We got to go with him, with what he's doing. We can't walk into our, into our relationship with Jesus or into church or small group or prayer and be like, Jesus, uh, what can you do for me today? Jesus, I need this for me. Jesus, what can you do for me? How can you make me feel this? How can you give me what I want? Because what happens then is when, the, when I don't get what I want, I'll get offended. I'll get angry. I'll leave the church. I'll leave my small group. I'll stop praying. I'll stop worshiping. And then I don't have any oil and my flame burns out. And then, I, then I'm just a zombie, a dead person walking. Christianity, okay, this is going to feel contradictory, but it's not. Christianity is not a private religion, okay? It's not this, I'm going to do this by myself at home, and I don't want to be bothered. I'm not going to church. God isn't, I, I, and I said this. God is not contained in the four walls of a church, and he's not, and he shouldn't be, right? But it was my excuse to not be a part of a body. It was my excuse to not go to church. And I think sometimes we have these two extremes. Either I will only be alone at home with Jesus in the Word sometimes when I feel like it or when it's convenient, or I will only go to church and I won't go to, when I won't get in the secret place ever because that's just, that's not convenient either. But don't you know that we need both? We need our, our, our private, personal relationship with Jesus, and we need community. We need to be in groups. We have to be in groups. Guys, I would not be standing. I have wavered. I have gone to and from Jesus my whole life, my whole entire life. I'm going to be 39 this year. My whole life, I have been like, I love you, Jesus, everything. And then I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is really shiny over here. And then it's like, oh, that hurts too bad. I love you, Jesus. Help me, fix me, heal me. Oh, this is shiny over here. My whole entire life, a roller coaster, a yo-yo, whatever you want to call it, it was not pretty. 
The only way that I stayed consistent with him, the only way I was able to steward that seed that was planted in me in Open Heavens Conference is community. It's because I have small groups and I had to make the choice to let my yes be yes and my no be no. I had to make the choice that even when I don't feel like it, even when I don't want to, I'm gonna go. Especially when I don't want to, I'm gonna go. And I'll tell you, the women in my group will tell you, especially the nights they don't wanna go, they absolutely, everything in them is saying, stay on the couch, just stay home, spend time with your kids, spend time with your husband, which are all noble good things, right? But then they come to group and they're like, dang, I needed this. Thank you, Jesus, for this. I needed this. Because you, you get something from community that you won't get by yourself. God has a perspective in each of those women that I can't see. And my mind is blown every time they speak. And you know what? We go through hard times. We have gone through, we had two women who both got pregnant. And we had been praying for them to get pregnant. Okay, they both got pregnant at the same time. It was miraculous. We were celebrating and both of them miscarried at the same time. And we didn't understand. We didn't understand. We had prayed, we had believed and we didn't know why this happened. But you know what? We leaned on each other. We held each other up and we mourned together. And you know, both of those women are pregnant. And both of them are very healthy, have very healthy pregnancies, and they're both about to have baby showers and have babies come into this world in May. So thank you, Jesus. I can't imagine getting through that if that was me. I couldn't imagine getting through that without my group of women. So anyways, there's my plug for groups. We need it. We need community. We're meant for community. We need to invest in each other. We need to invest in covenant, even when it's not convenient. We need to invest in covenant relationships, good, bad, and ugly relationships. Not the kind of relationships that when you offend me, I'm not gonna talk to you anymore. That used to be me. I'm like, well, I'm just not gonna talk to her anymore. I'm not gonna see her. I was so afraid of con confrontation. I was afraid of conflict. So if, if they were rude to me, I was just like, I'm just gonna slowly let that fizzle out. You know, I'll text them with a smiley face here and there, but yeah. No, and I learned that that's garbage, so don't do that. That was really bad. I learned that by confronting a problem, which is super uncomfortable, and I don't know anybody who, who's like, yes, conflict, let's do this, except maybe Wendy Muska. <laughs> She's a therapist. You, yeah, if you know her, you know her. I don't know anybody who's excited for confrontation, but I'll tell you what, it's that, it's those moments when you decide to confront a situation because you value the relationship more than you value protecting yourself from something uncomfortable, that's when roots happen. That's when your relationships take root. That's when you, you guys become closer and this covenant now has been cut. That's when it's like, all right, this is for life. This is no matter what. This was a hard thing. It sucked. It was scary. We got through it. And now guess what? I trust you more. Because again, history defines our relationships, the ups and the downs. Uh, piano. Anna, did you want to? Okay. I tried. I tried. Do you want to? Is that? Okay. You guys always love the piano part, right? Because then you know it's like almost done, right? <laughs> I'm going to talk for another hour. <laughs> Joke's on you. Christianity is not pretty. It's not popular. It's not sexy. It's not culturally accepted. It's not like the world. And it's really not convenient. Jesus actually said you'll have to hate your mother and father in comparison to how you love me. He said, you're gonna have to leave everything to follow me. He said, you're gonna have to die to yourself every day. You're gonna have to pick up your cross every day. Die to self, not have a museum of self, but die to self and follow me. That's what he said. Christianity may not be pretty, but it's how you carry the glory. You know how you carry glory? Every six steps. 
you slaughter, you slaughter, and you dance with all your might. That's how you carry glory. That's how you carry the presence of God into Jerusalem. Six steps, slaughter, slaughter. It's a bloody trail all the way from Obed-Edom's house into Jerusalem. It is a bloody mess of a trail. And you know what? That's history. That's Genesis to the cross was a bloody trail of sacrifice until Jesus finally paid it all. He's worth it, guys. He's worth it. Right after David brought the ark into Jerusalem, he decided, he said, you know what? How can I live in this big, beautiful house when the Lord is out there in a tent? And he wanted to build a house for God. God didn't let him build the house, but he was so moved by the love of David that David thought outside of himself. David had everything. He even had the Ark of the, of the Covenant now. He even had the, pres- the presence. That's what he wanted. But he thought outside of himself and he thought, I want to honor God. What does God want? God didn't ask him. And God said, I didn't ask anyone to build me a house. I never asked anyone in all of history to build me a house. But God was so moved by that, that he made a covenant with David. And now Jesus, if you look through the New Testament, Jesus is even known as the son of God and the son of David. What an honor. I wonder why we don't think more about God and his heart and his desires. I wonder why we see this relationship as so one-sided. I think it's because we don't look at this relationship as personal as we should. This relationship is like a marriage and you should look at it as a marriage. It is a marriage. The word says that he's your bridegroom. He's your husband, it says. We need to look at this as a marriage because how well is your marriage gonna thrive if you're not having that alone time together? How well is your marriage gonna thrive if you're not talking and not listening to what he has to say or she has to say? How well is your marriage gonna thrive if all you think about and all of your marriage is about you and what you want? We need to think of our spouse, Jesus. We need to ask him, what are you thinking? What what song do you wanna hear today, Jesus? What song can I sing to you? God, God has feelings. That was a revelation to me. I knew like Jesus had feelings because he was like fully man and fully God. But Holy Spirit has feelings. I know that because the word says you can grieve him. The Father has feelings. I know that because the word says he delights. He says he gets angry. He says he gets sad. If you don't know God as he's described in the Bible, then I'm gonna offend you by saying that you might not know him at all. If you don't know him as faithful, just, loving, kind, merciful, gracious, forgiving, patient, wise, infinite, holy, personal, and close, then you may not know him at all. But I wanna tell you that you can know him It's his heart's desire that you know him. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 says, went to the wrong tab. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. In these I delight, says the Lord. He wants you to know him. John 17, three says, and this is Jesus speaking, and this is eternal life that you may, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life. Knowing him is eternal life. My last scripture, Jeremiah 31, 33 and 34. 
uh, if you look in 32, it says, though I was a husband to them. So there's some scripture proof for you. 33, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. He longs for you to know him. He wants you to seek him. He says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. He wants you to seek him so he can show himself to you. Oftentimes we seek him with our list of demands. We seek him with what we want, with what we're craving, with with us, 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 our hopes, our dreams. Try seeking him just to know him. Read the Bible and try to find what he likes. Try to find what he doesn't like. There are scriptures that will tell you what God loves and what he hates, because he does hate. He has hate for things. I listed them once. Search the scriptures and you'll see Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. Look for him, know him. He's worth it. So let's all stand. And we're gonna pray. I'll have you all close your eyes just for fun. You could pray with your eyes open, I guess. Christianity is not glamorous. It's not popular. It's not sexy, but it's worth it. He is worth the inconvenience. He is worth being uncomfortable. He is worth giving up everything and laying my heart and dreams before him. Jesus, you're worth it. We, we sing it in all these songs, Jesus. We say you're worthy. You are worthy. You are worth it, Jesus. You are worth everything. You inconvenienced yourself by leaving glory to come here to be born in a barn, to live and to die for us. That was quite inconvenient, Lord, and we're so grateful that you did it. So Lord, what an honor it is for us to die every day to ourselves for you. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, I ask that you help us to stop looking at ourselves and to look at Jesus. Help us to stop searching ourselves and say, Lord, search me. Help us to lock eyes with you, Jesus, and to say, Jesus, you search my heart. And if you find anything that displeases you, reveal it. Holy Spirit, help us to have a desire to know you. Help us to have a desire to know the heart of the Father. Help us to have a desire to know your personality, what you like, what you don't like. Help us to ask the questions like, Jesus, what are you thinking today? Because you are thinking today. Because you are feeling today. Thank you, Jesus, that you are real, that you are tangible, that you are our husband, and that you are a faithful, covenant-keeping God, even when we aren't. Help us, Holy Spirit, to be faithful. Give us the grace to get up early. Give us the grace to make those sacrifices. We want you. We want more of you. That's why we're here on a Saturday night because it's you that we long for, Jesus. It's you that can satisfy every desire. Help us, heal us, change us, thaw out the icy parts of our heart, God. We yield ourselves fully to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. If I could have the ministry team come up, if you need further prayer, or if, I mean, if you need more prayer about this or whatever, I encourage you to come up here. I'm just gonna end with this. The Lord gave this to me in February and he reminded me of it. He said, I asked him, I said, show me your heart, God. I wanna see your heart. And he said, Sarah, here is my heart to be known by you and to be welcomed in to know you. What is love? What does it look like? What does it sound like? It's intrusive to your thoughts 
It's constantly showing on your face. It oozes out of your actions and drips from your demeanor. It's what you talk about, think about, and dream about. It looks like sacrifice and time. It gives all it has to be with the object of its devotion. It is immovable, unshakable, and committed. It has eyes for no one and nothing else. It is steady and honest, not trying to pretend to be anything other than authentic. It is pure. It is untainted by the opinions of others. It is rash and foolish while at the same time being strategic and thoughtful. It is always and forever eternal. It is me and I am for you. I pray that you get to know God like that and that you get to love him like that and that I love him like that. All right, so come get prayer and have a wonderful night. Love you guys.